Hey y'all, welcome to Big Texas Bossing, the show that spills the Texas tea on bossing up, tossing coins, and living your biggest and best life on your own terms. I'm your host, Lalani Wilson-Jones, and today on my fashion segment, we will talk about being a boss in the world of ownership and legacy building through fashion. It's time for Big Texas Bossing with Lalani Wilson-Jones. Spilling the tea on Bossing Up. Join this week's conversation with the owner of Texas-based luxury fashion line, St. Alexander, for a deeper dive into what it means to bet on your abilities and create a lane of exclusivity. Welcome to the show, Nick Deshay. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. St. Alexander is a cut-and-sew streetwear brand based in Bastrop, Texas right outside of the Austin city limits. Nicholas Deshay, who is the founder and lead designer for St. Alexander, is a self-taught sewist who found his love in designing and constructing custom luxury accessories. His passion for sewing was inspired by watching his grandmother sew as a child. She was known as the family's personal seamstress. Additionally, with the long history of car mechanics and carpenters throughout his family tree, Quality craftsmanship has been ingrained into the brands of his DNA. It was only natural that Nick gravitated towards such a hands-on approach in tailorship with the recent launch of St. Alexander and its expansion into streetwear apparel. The brand continues to solidify its identity in creating upscale offerings using high-quality fabrics to execute modern and distinctive silhouettes. Wow. So tell us, who is Nick Deshay? Oh, man. I don't think anybody's asked me that in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, Nick Deshay, if I could put it into a few words, um, small town guy, hardworking. Um, I'm a person who loves family. I love to create. Uh, I love to be inspired in my everyday life. Um, and I love fashion. I love making things with my hands. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. How did you find your way into tailorship? Um, so, like you mentioned, uh, my grandmother, uh, she really was the first one who gave me a close-up, you know, representation of what it is to sew, tailor, alter, um, so I saw that when I was really young and then, um, actually her son, who is my uncle, um, he's about seven or eight years older than I am. Um, so when I was young, like in elementary school, he's now going into like middle school, high school, and we kind of grew up together. And when you have somebody who's a little bit older than you like that, you know, you pick up on all of the things that they're interested in. So when I'm in, when I was young, he's going into middle school, high school. So he's putting me on to the music, the culture, the fashion, and all of these things at such a young age. And I'm kind of just picking up on everything, you know. And uh, I always tell people I can recall being at recess when I was in like elementary school. And I'm playing on the playground. But when the bell rings to go back to class, I don't go back to class. I run to the bathroom so I can clean off my shoes because I've been playing on the playground all day. <laughs> now, I'm in elementary school. This is not something I should really be thinking about at this time. But from being around my uncle so much, you know, this is one of the things in the culture. You got to keep your sneakers clean, you know, and it's just small things like that that have stuck with me from a very young age. And then, you know, when I got to the age, probably in my early 20s, where I really wanted to venture out, and, you know, try to create this fashion line. It's something that I always wanted to do, but I necessarily didn't have the uh, courage. In the beginning, I really didn't have an idea for a complete fashion line. I just knew I wanted to be involved in some some capacity. Um, And it was watching my grandmother when I was younger. That's what really gave me the confidence to even venture out, to even start to teach myself how to sew and believe that it could actually be done. Um, so a lot of what I do owe to to my grandmother and just showing me that uh, firsthand. 
Okay, so did you start sewing as a young child or you started sewing when you got older? Yeah, I started uh, 2013, so it's going on about nine years now. It's when I first started uh, sewing. Nice, nice. Yeah. Now, where did the inspiration behind the name St. Alexander come from? Uh, so Alexander is actually my middle name. Um, so when I was coming up with the name of the brand, I, I did want it to have, you know, my identity in it. And when I was researching names, uh, I looked up what Alexander actually meant. Um, and so my name is Nicholas. My first name is Nicholas, middle name Alexander. Nicholas actually means the victory of the people. Alexander actually means the defender of the people. Um, and it's kind of crazy how those two are, are very similar. Uh, but I wanted to have the Alexander in there because, like I said, it means the, the defender of the people. And so I'm incorporating that into this brand, into this fashion aspect of the brand. And one way I think that I facilitate that meaning is when I make clothes, I have the people in mind in the sense of I want to bring the people a high quality product. Uh, something that people would design, uh, deem designer level quality, but my price is not what you would normally pay for a designer level item. Uh, and because I'm in control on every level, so that's sourcing fabric, production, to the final product, I'm in control of all of those things. So I really do have a say so in the, in the product and the price, I mean. Um, and I, I really want to keep that at the forefront. I want to make everything high quality, but also reasonable, reasonably priced at the same time. Right. Now, a lot of uh, fashion houses go with various overseas companies to sew their products. Are you still sewing yeah. in-house or are you overseas? Yeah, everything is, is still in-house. Um, nice. And that's something that I'm really intentional about as well. Um, I know sometimes when you, you deal with overseas from the things that I've heard and the things that I've seen, uh, some of the practices, the labor practices can be unethical. You really don't know what's going on in these different countries and the work environments for the people. Um, and aside from that, I think people really take pride in, in knowing that the, that the piece that they're wearing was actually made here in the States. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Now, you and your wife are leave, leaving a legacy for your future. And mm -hmm. how, how is that as far as the partnership and the dynamics of working with your beautiful wife? <laughs> uh, so working with my wife, it actually, for me, it works really well. Um, one thing that I learned in our case is opposites really do attract. Uh, me and my wife are very different in our personalities and as well as what we bring to the table on the business end. And one thing we've learned is to stay in our lane, you know, because mm -hmm. we got to be around each other all the time. Right. And so being able to stay in our lane has really kept our, it, 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 it uh, it's good for a peaceful work environment <laughs> as well as a productive work environment. So me, I'm more of the creative, hands-on, technical, I handle all of that stuff. My wife is more of the administrative structure. She has a very uh, creative, uh, organizational mind. So she takes care of a lot of the things that I'm not good at. And I have no interest in being good at. <laughs> right, right. So it's yeah, a win-win. So I, I think we complement each other really well. Absolutely. That's wonderful. How did you decide on such a niche market that you have? And then when did the decision come to venture out? Uh, so I first started uh, uh, around, like I said, 2013. And I wasn't doing apparel at that time. I was doing accessories. So I was doing leather bags. I was doing custom hats at the time. Um, and it wasn't until we launched officially in 2020 that I actually ventured out into the apparel side of things, which is where I wanted to be uh, from the beginning. Okay. Um, 
But as far as the niche goes, like that's one thing I've kind of always understood about myself. I always do things different. I never do things the way the popular way or the way that everybody else is doing them. Right. And so when it came to cutting so um that just felt the most natural to me because I have a, a unique, I think a unique perspective on fashion and the pieces uh, that I put out. And so, yeah, like the smaller market, I love that. Like, like I said, I never do just what, what is expected or was, you know, kind of widely accept, accepted by everyone. Right. So who would you say your fashion influences are? Uh, de- definitely Kanye. Kanye was huge for me uh, even before, you know, he had his own clothing line. Um, I know he had his shoes, the Red Octobers. That was a crazy shoe that he dropped. But even before he started doing his own stuff, I would watch him. And there was a, it was actually a website back in the day, like probably late 2000s. It was a website called Cool Spotters. And Cool Spotters was a website. It was basically like a paparazzi. Type website oh. where they would photograph, you know, different celebrities, athletes, or whatever, and they basically would tell you everything that they had on, from the clothes to the hats to the accessories to the laptop that they was carrying to the bottle of water that they were carrying, wow. and it really gave you like everything about that. And I will watch, you know, how he will put outfits together, the clothes, the brands. And I would kind of just study it because I, I was like, man, I really vibe with that style and how he puts looks together. And uh, from watching him and studying, you know, the brands that he wears, and I would go to the Neiman Marcuses and the stores like that. And it was that's when I first kind of started getting introduced to the designer level of streetwear. And I would go to these stores just to be like, you know, what what's so what uh why like why what justifies the high price points of the of this t-shirt like this is a five hundred dollar t-shirt right like what what's justifying that that price point and i would just go and walk around the store and try on clothes feel the fabrics look at the seams and that's just how my mind works i like to i like to see and investigate how things are made and why people feel this way when they put on this garment uh, so Kanye definitely that was that was one of my biggest influences. Wow. And originally you started in California. What made you transition back to Central Texas? Uh, yeah. So when I started my custom pieces, I started that while I was still here in Austin. Then we relocated uh, to Cali. Uh, we uh, moved there. My uncle was starting a business out there. Um, and they kind of made a way for us to come out there as well so we can kind of see how they were operating because they knew this is the way that I wanted to go. I wanted to go down this creative path. So being around them while they were doing these things was a great opportunity for me to just see. And another added bonus was, you know, downtown LA that's where fashion district is. So that was a great opportunity for me. Um, and I would just randomly take you know, field trips down to fashion district and just, and just walk around just so I can get immersed in the culture and what this really is. Um, and I learned so much uh, when I was there, made a lot of relationships when I was there. Um, and then COVID hit uh, 2020. Right. And, uh, and this was kind of at the peak of the pandemic. And me and my wife decided to just come back to Texas periodically just to check on everybody, really make sure everybody was okay, you know, check on the family and just be around family. Everything was closed. We were like, we don't have to be here right now. You know, let's go home and just be with family for a little bit. Um, And when we got back, you know, one week turned into a month, turned into two months. And, you know, we we thought it was going to blow over, you know, maybe in a month or two, everything was going to go back to normal. Um, And when we realized it's probably going to be like this for a while. Uh, that's when we made the decision, you know, to move back, relocate back to Central Texas. Um, and I made the, I think I made the connections that I needed to make in fashion district. And I just made the decision. I was like, you know, being here was great, but the way that, um, 
the economy has changed in terms of um, marketing and having a business, an online business, and social media, the way that that has changed how people do business, I was like, you know, I don't necessarily have to be here to do what I'm doing now. I made the connections that I need to make, and I can, I probably, I can, I feel like I can do this from Austin. Um, and it's been great. Being back has been great. Good, good. So it's definitely worked out for, for you making the move. Yeah. Okay, considering that gas right now is $6 a gallon in California, it was yeah. probably a good <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I realize you're probably working on some different expansion ideas and you have a residency at a local shop in Austin. Are you wanting to go into a major department chain or are you going to stay in the boutique world? Yeah, that's a conversation that we've been having recently. Um, and like I mentioned, I feel like social media and you know, the economy, the way that it's changed, it kind of turned the whole structure on its head because, you know, when you think of the old model and it's across industries, whether it's sports, music, fashion, the old model was, if I'm really trying to do something, I need to go, physically go where my market is. So if you were a musician, you needed to go to, you know, depending on what type of music, I need to get to, uh, what's the country music? Uh, Nashville. Nashville. I need to go to Nashville. Or if I was a rapper, I need to go to New York. I need to go to Atlanta. I need to go to Cali. Uh, when it comes to fashion, oh, I got to get into the big box stores to get my product out. And the way that the internet and the way we do business now has changed things, you really don't have to physically go to these places because I can literally create a product and a website and an Instagram, and I can be in front of my customer. Um, and so when we partnered with the guys at Kicking It, that was a great opportunity for us. It's a local store. Um, it's at a premier shopping location. Um, and like we talked about before, I like the niche, the tight community. Uh, it's more personal. That way I love the collaboration. I love that versus going more of the traditional widespread market. Um, and, and also I love creating experiences. So like pop-up markets. Um, that's one thing that, of course, this is a much bigger brand. Uh, but fear of God, they don't necessarily have a, a storefront, but they'll do different pop-ups at different locations. Um, and it's really about curating and experience. And I think that's right. something that people appreciate as well, especially with the pandemic and how everything was locked down. You know, people like getting out and ex and experiencing different things at different uh, secluded places and really just creating an experience. Um, so I think definitely one of the things we want to do is build up the online, our online presence as well as continue to do smaller collaborations like we did at, uh, at Kicking It. Okay, so would you say exclusivity is the character of the brand or would you say? Absolutely. Okay, and Absolutely. are your pieces yes. limited as far as uh, the quantity that you manufacture? Yeah, so we, so we don't do huge quantities and how our business typically goes is it's make to order. So like I said, we are cut and sew and everything takes place here. So nice. our business model is very different from a lot of clothing lines, whereas, you know, most clothing lines or a lot of clothing lines will buy clothes, resell those clothes with their uh, imagery and logos and things on them. Our model is we buy fabric and we make clothes and then we put our logos and everything, all that stuff on them. Um, so we'll go buy however much fabric that we have will sell until it's gone. So we don't, we don't, um, we don't keep a big inventory because that's one of the things that we want to be mindful of too, especially in the fashion industry. There's a lot of waste uh, that happens. So, you know, on the environmental tip, we really want to do our part and not add to the problem. Um, so we do make to order um, smaller quantities, 
Um, but because we make everything, we're able to restock as many times as we need to, as long as we have access to the fabric. Yeah. Right. Now, are your fabrics local or are they imported? Uh, so a lot of the fabrics we'll get uh, in L.A. Uh, some of those fabrics are uh, imported. Uh, but a lot of the things that we continually restock on, uh, like our one of our best sellers was our raw collection. That product is actually made here uh, in the states. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a mix of both. So a nice mix. How do you select? Uh, like let's say, how do you select your lineup for your winter twenty two collection? So I'm a. I'm kind of a in the moment type of person and I go by a feeling. Um, so sometimes, you know, it's everything's very inspiration based. My wife is more of the planner. I'm more of it's a feeling. Um, so sometimes there's a mix. She has to kind of hone me in right. and focus more so I can plan down the road. Um, but sometimes it's literally in the moment. I'll have a feeling. I have some silhouettes that I want to go with and I just go from there. Okay. Well, that works. That works. Yeah. What's your perspective since we talked a little bit about who does what part? What's your perspective on goal setting in your creative space and, and the strategy or does your wife like, do you all sit up and, Hey, we're going to do this and that. And then she writes <laughs> everything out or, do you participate in that? No, no, it's definitely, everything is definitely a collaborative effort. But when it comes to planning, she is definitely the initiator. That's not something that I just naturally go to and say, okay, we need to plan to do this. She's definitely going to initiate that, but it's, it's definitely going to be a, a, a collaborative effort, yeah. That's great. That is. So what keeps you motivated? Um, so we talk about legacy, uh, like I said before, a big thing with me is, is freedom. Um, the thing that keeps me motivated is I love what I do. I love creating. I want to build a life where I'm able to provide for myself and my family by the things that I create. Um, we're actually in the process of building a house slash creative space, slash loft here on my family's property. Um, and that's one of the things, legacy, like we're thinking about our legacy, our future children, the things that we expose them to as far as our lifestyle and how, you know, we have the ability to be self-sustained, but we don't have to depend on anybody else. We have the ideas, we have the power as a people, and I mean, this goes even into just the black community as well. You know, we have everything we need in our community. And that's something that's really big to us. That's something that we want to impart to our children. Um, so yeah, future, future legacy building, that's definitely something that keeps me motivated. That's awesome. And I know that you followed your legends and you're their legacy and you're still creating for your legacy but would you say as a black man uh in america today that you have more challenges or are your obstacles easier to overcome because of all of the things that have happened during the pandemic really yeah um i mean that's a i would i don't know how much time that that really justifies a longer response that i think that we could give right now um but you know, we've, we've definitely had a, a uphill journey in this country. And, you know, I'm really mindful to be grateful for where we are now because we definitely have, don't have to go through everything that our ancestors have went through. And although we're not where we're going to be or where we should be, uh, I feel like we're more free now than we've ever been. We're more liberated now than we've ever been we have more opportunities now than we've ever had um and so i feel like as a black man as a black person in this country 
there are obviously going to be barriers to entry, you know, everywhere that we turn. But like I said, if we can look back on our ancestors and they can make it, they can get us to, because they have, we're standing on their shoulders right now. If we can be sitting here right now as a result of the things that they have to go through um, when we first got to this country, we have, we have everything that we need. Yes, they're going to be, they're going to be barriers. They're going to be difficulties. They're going to be hardships. It's going to be harder for us. But I feel like that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why we need to, as a community, we got to collaborate more. We got to build more with our community, within our community and work together. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing as well. Uh, just with social media and the internet, you know, now you can get a message out there quickly. As a black man, you can see another black man that's doing the same thing I'm doing, and I can glean inspiration from him. Whereas 40 years ago, it wasn't that easy. You know, you have to know somebody that was doing something. You have to be able to touch them and see their journey. You know, so I feel like now is a great time for us to to come together and be more or attain to be more unified than we've ever been. Right. And would you say today's times uh, drive your content as far as staying relevant and making sure that your brand is out there as a forerunner in your market? Uh, yes. Uh, some of it, yes. So we just did a, a Black is Gold release. It was a small capsule that we did. It's something that I, that I wanted to accomplish during uh, Black History Month. And, you know, the thing I'm learning is, like, especially when it comes to streetwear, and one of my friends says this all the time, he says, you know, a T-shirt is a billboard. And fashion in itself is a, is a means of expression. You know, you mm-hmm. can express a lot of things through what you wear, your outfit. You can tell a lot about the person and what they wear. You can get a lot from that. Um, and I feel like having a brand, especially a black brand, um, I think it's a great way for us to express a lot of these maybe controversial topics, uh, but do it in a creative way, um, you know, with Instagram and all of these apps. There's so many creative ways that we can get a message out. Um, and, and having a fashion brand is definitely one of those ways that we could do that. I'm appreciative of that opportunity. Right. To be here yeah. and be able to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's next? What can we expect from you? What will we see from the line? Tell us what's the hot and happening. Yeah. So we actually have a, so we're doing a, we're planning to do a, actually this is something uh, Charmaine, uh, we're trying to include her in as well. Okay. Uh, but we're, we're doing a fashion show and we're collaborating with, uh, he's actually my cousin who's a, another local artist. Uh, DZ Brown, y'all make sure y'all go and check him out. Uh, he just performed at uh, ACL Festival last year. Uh, he's going to be at South by Southwest coming up. Uh, but yeah, that's my family. You know, we're both from Bastrop, uh, both creative minds. And he's having his uh, video premiere, uh, and we're planning on doing that May twenty second. So we're he's going to do his his video premiere, and we're also going to collaborate him. And in the same venue, we're going to be doing a fashion show, and uh, debuting some of our our up and coming pieces. Um, so definitely that uh, we're going to do a lot more pop ups this year, um, and we're just we're going to continue to go up. You know, we're going to continue to create and continue to go up you to build right well that all sounds yeah. wonderful tell us where we can shop the brand uh so the website uh www.stalexander.co that's c-o not com dot co uh, so yeah there also you can check us out on instagram at the saint alexander you can go and follow my wife at stylus j walker that's where we are. <laughs> okay. Well, that sounds wonderful. Now, does she style outside of the brand or she strictly stays with the brand for her styling? 
No, no, no. So she's actually uh, a own. She's her own personal stylist in her own right. She has her own business. Uh, just so happens that she's my wife and she can do it at St. Alexander as well. <laughs> <laughs> right. The two for one benefit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, she, she has, she has her own business. She has her, her own clients. Um, and again, this is one of those things where it just works well. Us being together it just works well together. Right. Well, we'll definitely have yes. to get her on the show. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, thank you. We appreciate you. And I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. Thank you guys for having me. Yes. Big Texas Boston Podcast can be found on every major streaming site. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Big Texas Boston. Subscribe to Big Texas Boston Podcast YouTube channel alerts and get every episode. Until next time, keep bossing up, tossing coins, and living your biggest and best life. Thank you. Oh, oh,